chapter 12, part, shall we say, 1A, which is the follow-up, uh, the extension on uh, chapter 12, part 1, that uh, from the lecture on uh, Tuesday. I just have the uh, learning outcomes here for you, just to, to remind you of what we're dealing with. What we're really going to focus on in this uh, video are, is this right here, this Big Mac, the power stroke, how it's initiated, the three questions, ATP status, myosin configuration, and actin binding status. Now, one thing I should uh, note about this is that these mechanisms down here play directly into um, this mechanism right here. So this one is actually related to initiating the power stroke. So, so th these things are, are, are intimately connected. So even though I say it here, I'm actually sort of repeating myself down here. So make sure that you see that connection. But it shouldn't be too hard to see, if you know what I mean. Just to remind you again that these terms are very, very useful for you in terms of understanding what you should know but also how they function. You should understand, especially these guys down here, what the, what the function is, what they're doing, um, be able to recognize a uh, correct function. And also remind you of the, uh, the different bands, the different zones. Why? Because we need to understand the sliding filament theory of uh, muscle contraction. as well as these structures. Again, these are again these are terms that we've already seen. Now we're putting them in context of the cell, like for instance, the T-tubules, the transverse tubules, the sarcoplasmic reticulum in, there in, in uh, blue, the mitochondria in purple, that sort of thing. Again, putting these things in context. Ask yourself, what do these things do? What are these things doing as a part of muscular function? So today we're going to deal with this side of the equation right here, this side of the whole process. We have some event upstream that triggers uh, a depolarization at the neuromuscular junction that leads to a set of events that we're going to talk about in the other video, excitation, contraction, coupling. But where we're going to live today is right here. When we see calcium, we enter what is known as a contraction relaxation cycle uh, that involves what's known as a power stroke. Uh, one thing I want you to get in your minds right now, and if you're taking notes, which I hope you are, taking notes, I want you to write down that ATP does not cause contraction. Okay? ATP does not cause contraction. It, it, it provides the energy for contraction, but it is not driving it. Okay, that's very, very important. And a lot of students miss that. So I want to make sure that you write that down and then see what I'm talking about in the subsequent slides. And so now we have what is known as the contraction relaxation cycle. Now, this figure is in your book and I find it modestly useful or very useful, but there are a few little idiosyncrasies about this figure that I need to tell you about. First of all, when we start the contraction relaxation cycle, I prefer to start down here at the five o'clock position, um, which is the relaxed state, which is where the muscle is most of the time. Um, uh, the other thing that I uh, want to show you about this is that we have this myosin. We have two myosin heads here. And you notice one is at, a, at, a, at a, an, an acute angle here, and another myosin is at an obtuse angle. Every myosin molecule has two of these heads. And if you were to put your hand on the table with your index finger and your middle finger and pretend like you're a human being walking with your fingers, that's kind of how these heads interact with the, uh, with the actin. So... Let's look at this figure right here that I'm circling. This myosin head is in the flexed position, okay? And this other lighter colored myosin head is in the cocked position. Okay, so it's at an obtuse angle, whereas this one is at an acute angle. Down here, both heads are cocked, okay? So you see obtuse and obtuse. Over here, this one is flexed, this one is cocked. We're, when, for discussion purposes, we're really only going to talk about the dark myosin. We're not going to talk about that other one. We're just going to pretend there's just one myosin head here rather than trying to do two, if you know what I mean. Okay, We don't want to get too crazy. We want to keep it as simple as possible. 
But what we're doing is we're transitioning between this relaxed state here at the 5 o'clock position and the rigor state here in the 12 o'clock position. You have to be able to answer three questions, but more also as important is you have to think transitionally. What's happening between this box and this box? We're going from a cocked position to a flexed position. So we have to think transitionally in addition to just being able to answer the questions, okay? You can do some brute memorization here, and that's all well and good, but I want you to begin thinking transitionally. How do we get from here to here? How do we get from here to here? Think of it transitionally, all right? So the three questions we need to be able to answer about this dark colored myosin head, okay, in all these pictures, is that myosin cocked or is it flexed? Okay. In this picture, it is flexed. Think flex when you're flexing your bicep. Okay. Here, the myosin has been put into the cocked position. Okay. It is in an obtuse angle. And here's a point that I want to make to you. Right here, we're bound to ATP, and then when we transition to this picture, we are no longer ATP. We have cocked the myosin. Okay? That's what I mean in the last slide, is that ATP is not driving the flexing of myosin. What ATP is doing is it's configuring the myosin into a cocked position, like a flintlock on a, on, a, uh, on, a, on a flintlock rifle. We pull that hammer back and it locks, and there's potential energy there. And then when that potential energy gets released, it goes into the flexed position. So ATP doesn't have, uh, only has an indirect role in transitioning from here to here. And year after year after year, Students keep saying, well, we hydrolyze ATP to get from here to here, and that's not true, and the figure shows it. We're already hydrolyzed right here. The only difference is that we have released that inorganic phosphate. We still have the ADP in the terms of that yellow box there. Okay. Here we have ATP, and now we have ADP and PI. This is the hydrolysis reaction, and even says it here in the caption. But again, students year after year stare at this figure and they don't think about the figure. You need to be cognizant. You need to be mindful about these figures. And that's why I'm kind of beating this like a dead horse. So back to cocked or flexed. Ask yourself, cocked or flexed? This one is flexed. This one is cocked. This one is flexed. This one is flexed. This one is flexed. Okay? Binding status of actin or myosin, and that actin can bind in one of two, shall we say, two and a half ways, because there is a point right here we're bound, right here we're released, okay? So that's a little bit of a trick question. I'm going to just say that's loose, okay? We'll just pretend that's loose. I don't normally ask about binding status in this figure anyway, but here... Right here, we could be loose or we could be tight. It just depends on whether or not calcium is present. If we are in the relaxed state and there is no calcium, troponin and tropomyosin are covering up those light patches on the actin, which means that this, thing, this myosin is bound loosely. Okay. Once calcium arrives and affects troponin, moves tropomyosin, then we shift to a tight, and that's when we ensue. So we're tight, 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 and tight. Okay. This box essentially is the only figure that has a potential for loose binding, because here the myosin is not bound at all. Okay. I should probably say not bound, but I'm not going to get that crazy about it. Okay. We can just say tight, or we can say loose. If you want to see an example of loose binding, just take your wrist and flop it around a little bit, or just let your arm flop around. That's loose myosin binding, because you're not contracting any of those muscles, at least not for a long period of time anyway. So that's question number two, actin status. Are we binding tightly, or are we binding loosely? The third is the status of ATP. So for instance, is ATP present, like here? Is it hydrolyzed to ADP and PI, like here? Do we have just ADP, like right here, because the myosin has, has, has left? 
or are we at nothing? Okay. So those are the four possible answers. So what happens is we bind ATP, and when we bind ATP, we release the myosin. At that point, that's when we hydrolyze the myosin and cock the myosin head. Okay? So we're hydrolyzing the ATP in this step, and we release inorganic phosphate here, and then we finally release ADP here, and now we're in the rigor state. So when we go from, from relaxed to rigor, what happens is we bind tightly, we begin flexing. As we flex, we lose first the inorganic phosphate, second we lose the ADP. And this plays an important role in muscle fatigue. If we have too much inorganic phosphate, it may not want to release from the myosin, which prevents us from getting all the way to the rigor state. Okay? It will slow the kinetics of the power stroke. And so it's making fewer power strokes, which means less tension, which means fatigue in the muscle. There's a lot going on. There are lots of simple little steps. This is a classic example of having a bunch of balls in the air like a juggler. You have to be able to work with each individual ball if you want to work with all of them. So work on the individual balls, work on the transitions from one step to another, and let's work our way through this. When we're in the relaxed state, and here we have introduced troponin and tropomyosin, there is no calcium at this point, so troponin, that binding site for calcium, is empty. And so the configuration of tropomyosin is that it overlays that light-colored uh, site on actin, which is the high-affinity site. So right now, in the relaxed state, ATP is hydrolyzed and the myosin head is cocked. In fact, both of these heads happen to be cocked at this point. But the ATP, is, the, AD, the, the ATP status mean is that it's hydrolyzed. It is ADP and PI. There is no ATP. Show me ATP in this figure. Okay. This is the relaxed state, which is the equivalent of that 5 o'clock position in the previous figure. What we're doing here is we're waiting for a calcium signal. We're waiting for the release of calcium as part of excitation contraction coupling. So here we are down here. We're in this relaxed state, okay? Calcium, and when calcium comes along, several things happen. First of all, the troponin and tropomyosin move off of that light-colored side. It's not very well depicted here. But what we begin happening is we bind, myosin binds actin tightly. So we get increased calcium. Calcium binds the troponin. Troponin moves the tropomyosin away from that high affinity site, and myosin binds tightly or strongly to the actin and begins the power stroke. It says completes here, but I would say begins. And it is a very, very specific sequence. We bind tightly, we begin flexing. As we begin flexing, we lose the PI first. That's part of the whole fatigue mechanism that I talked about earlier this week. And we lose the ADP second. Okay. As we are flexing, and let's pretend this is the initial state of the myosin and we're transitioning to a flex state, that myosin head is going to, or that actin filament is going to slide. And it's going to slide in our reference to the left as the head goes from that obtuse angle to that uh, acute angle. We lose the PI first, and then we lose the ADP second. And when we get lose that ADP, now we're in the rigor state. Here's just another figure here. Myosin can't bind to actin unless it is cocked by ATP, and we should say ATP hydrolysis. Okay. ATP hydrolysis. So what we have here is the equivalent of the relaxed state. We've moved troponin and tropomyosin, and as we go from left to right, you can see the myosin head goes from an acute angle here to an, or an, an obtuse angle, excuse me, to an acute angle, okay? We have that acute angle here. What have we lost in this process? First, we're gonna lose PI, the inorganic phosphate. At the end of the power stroke, we're gonna lose that ADP. After binding, myosin exerts the force on actin. So it is not ATP that's causing this force to happen. ATP is merely setting up myosin so that it can exert force on actin. Okay. During the power stroke, first the, the inorganic phosphate detaches. 
and that obeys law of mass action kinetics and then ADP will also detach and I'm not sure about the kinetics there I haven't heard any any uh, any information about that after the power stroke it says myosin detaches but now let's fix this this is not entirely correct we have to bind another ATP before the myosin will detach that would not make any sense if you did the power stroke and then you released it. You would lose the, 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 the gain that you've gotten. So what's going to happen is we're going to lose the ADP. ATP is going to come in and then the myosin will detach. So let's kind of work through this. So here's our relaxed state down here. Calcium comes in. We bind tightly. We begin flexing. As we flex, we lose inorganic phosphate, we lose ADP at the end of uh, the, the power stroke, and now we're in the rigor state. Part of why bodies, when they die, they get very, very rigid, we call them stiffs for the first few hours, first 10, 12 hours, is that ATP has been depleted in those cells. You're no longer making ATP. You may have some residual ADP and PI on those muscles, and so what will happen is you'll get contraction, and you will line up in the rigor state, which holds on to that actin. This is the basis of rigor mortis. No ATP there, and so you can't get any transient relaxation to get back to the relaxed state. Okay? This is rigor mortis. You have a tightly bound myosin that's flexed. We have no ATP here, no ADP, no PI, and so it's stuck here. That's rigor mortis. We have to have ATP in order to release and then recock the myosin. So think transitionally. Calcium comes in, moves to trone and tropomyosin. We begin our power stroke. We bind tightly. We begin flexing. We lose the inorganic phosphate first. We lose the ADP second. And now we're in the rigor state. And so here's the rigor state. We are in a flexed position, tightly bound with no ATP or ADP or PI. Nothing is the answer. So those are the three questions. In order to get from the rigor state to the relaxed state, ATP has to come in. It will bind the myosin. The myosin will release the actin, and then we will hydrolyze the ATP in order to cock it. So here's the beginning of that ATP binding. We release the myosin. Now this head should probably be bound to the, the, the actin at this point. It's a, kind of a silly figure. Because again, we're walking, so usually one is attached while the other one isn't, if you know what I mean. So here's our head in question. We're going to hydrolyze it. We're going to cock it. And then now an open question occurs. If we cock the, the, the myosin and there is no calcium, if the calcium has been depleted, when we release that troponin and tropomyosin will slide over top of that high affinity site and we will stay in the relaxed state. If calcium is still present at this point, then troponin and tropomyosin will stay out of the way. And what will happen is we'll bind tightly again and go through another power stroke. Okay. So if we, if we bind ATP and we begin cocking it, it, the question is what's going on here? Is the calcium present or is it not? If it's not present, we will stay in the relaxed state, binding weakly to actin, cocked position, hydrolyzed ATP. But if the calcium signal is present, then we will go through another full cycle through the rigor state and then back to the relaxed state. Okay. It's not, it's just a little bit of thinking transitionally, thinking conditionally, work your way through the scenarios, be mindful about it, take a little bit of time. The reason I have you learn this is because there are multi-step pathways down the line that you're going to have to learn about in terms of other types of processes. So having this available to, to learn about helps you to begin thinking dynamically rather than statically. So putting this a little bit together, when we have a signal from the brain that results in action potentials down the nerves, the action potentials will then trigger this second message in the form of calcium inside the cytosol.
When the calcium appears, it moves the troponin and tropomyosin. We can bind tightly. We can begin flexing. When we begin flexing, we first lose the inorganic phosphate. Secondarily, we lose the ADP, and now we're in the rigor state. ADP, the, the myosin binds ATP over here, not shown. It releases the, the actin. The ATP hydrolyzes, and we cock the myosin head. If the troponin is back in and tropomyosin are back in place, we'd stay here. If there's more calcium, we would go through that cycle again. So the power stroke involves inorganic phosphate release at the beginning and ADP release at the end, and that puts us into rigor. And so that is the contraction relaxation cycle. You need to be able to think transitionally what's going on from here to here. You need to be able what's going on from here to here and here. I will never ask you to fully memorize all the entire figure and be able to draw it from scratch. So if you can do that, you rock. You will blow any question I have away. Okay? I guarantee it because that's more than I would ask you on the test. So why not go for it? Okay? Draw it to know it. Okay? It's a great way to, to reinforce that which you can see in your mind. So again, we're cycling through rigor state, relaxed state, rigor state, relaxed state. Whether we stay in the relaxed state when we come back depends on whether or not there's, a, there's calcium still in the cytosol. And that's it. That's it for this lecture today, for this video. If you have any questions, by all means, uh, reach out to me and I'll be glad to help you out. But I think this is one of those great times where you can draw it to know it in order to nail down this question and rock it on the exam. So thank you for your time and I will see you on the next video.